I hope this microphone's not blaring, but we're going to find out the hard way. So what we're going to do is we're going to have another quick look at railroad diagrams. We're going to then start drawing some railroad diagrams from my dingling programming language. Okay. So we're going to do two things. We associate ourselves with uh, meta languages and dingling. Who could tell me quickly, off the top of your head, if you can, what's a meta language? Dylan, please. It's the way of defining the syntax of the programming language. That is fantastic. So don't forget, we're not actually doing programming here. We are coming up with a programming language. Then we do a little bit of programming after the fact to test our syntax. Okay. Then I have my little dingaling programming language. Who remembers the key facets of my dingaling? That was horrible. <laughs> no capitals. And no complicated commands or anything like that. So let's re quickly rehash. I had begin, print, hello world, end. Simple as that. To make a variable, I had var the name, which was just a single, oh sorry, it could be just letters equals a value. Uh, I then had if statements, which were if something equals something, then else and if. Okay, I tried to keep it as simple as possible. In fact, it's sort of a little bit tailored after Visual Basic. Okay, I know none of you really probably have that much exposure to Visual Basic, but I thought I'd just mention that. All right, so we jumped into railroad diagrams. Now, I focused on the word railroad for a little while when we started this, and what was the main key point? You can't go backwards. Can't fly around. Can't do CVR. Can't do CVR. I'm glad you remember <laughs> that. Yes, my teaching works. <laughs> we uh, tried that, and it also can't uh, can't go back and can't turn around on the track. That's right, can't turn around. And on the so, the CPR, two hundred tons of train would probably do some pretty bad damage to some of the group heads if they tried. I'm, <laughs> I'm glad I put that then. <laughs> All right. So, who remembers? When you draw yourself a railroad diagram like this one, they're all separate little pieces and they all build up the syntax. <coughs> but what do I call this? I've said this is a letter and I've drawn the diagram here. Now I used a word last time to say what I was just creating. It started with E. I was creating a, an, element? an element, exactly. So every time I draw a diagram like this, it's another element on top of it, okay? So anyone remember what I call the little circles on the diagram themselves? They are terminals, yes. And there were two types of terminals, okay? There was this rounded one. If I scroll down, there was the square one. Okay, and this will be my last question before we get into the work. What was the difference between the square terminals or the rectangular terminals and the rounded ones that you see here? I'm just going to give someone else a chance. Sorry, Elia, first, yeah? Uh, the circular ones are a specific like, terminal. Yep. The square ones are group, one of a group of terminals. Fantastic way of saying it. Yes. So if you see a square one, look up and try and find the definition of it. So if you see letter in a rectangle, that means there's already a diagram which tells you what a letter is. And you look at letter, and this is what makes up a letter. Has anyone got any questions on any of that to start with before we jump into the dingaling programming language? Okay. Dingaling, -a -ling -a -ling. All right. Now, by the way, I produced these diagrams. Um, there's actually a railroad generator program on GitHub. You type in like a certain syntax and it spits out a diagram that looks like this. So if you're ever interested in making railroad diagrams other than drawing them, you can use some programs to generate them. I'm going to draw them today though, okay? Because I draw them slightly differently. I am going to do the most simple railroad diagram for my programming language. And it's this one here, my hello world. I want to get to a point that I can make a hello world program. Now... Most of you are probably thinking that, not a screen sketch, other one, sketch pad. All right, delete. A lot of you are probably thinking that I could create an element called hello world, something like that. And then I start my diagram by saying rounded one there and put begin. Notice I'm putting it all in lowercase, just like it is on the actual thing. Then I could go print, um, what could I do there? Oh yeah, I'll just put that in a circle and then we could go string and then end. Okay, a little zigzag there, it's just because I knew it wouldn't fit. Okay, so how does that look so far? Pretty straightforward. Now I am assuming that somewhere along the line I've, made, I've told my programming language what a string is because that's in the square rectangle there. 
Now, this is the simple way of doing it. I could just do that. Is everyone okay with that concept? So I start on the left, I hit begin, so I have to write the word begin. Then I hit the word print, so I have to write print. I hit a string, so I go back and I look for my definition of a string. I don't have one, okay? I just put that there for the moment. I then hit end, so I put the word end, and then I'm finished. And that would actually be fine for my Hello World program if every single Hello World program was exactly the same, but they're not, are they? This, does, this is not a very powerful programming language. All you can do is write begin, print, end, yay. All right, so what we actually have to do is step back a lot further and we have to define what the start of the program is, which is begin, what the end of the program is, which is end. We then have to uh, create what statements are. And we'll get to that in a moment. And we have to define what letters and numbers and things like that are. Okay, so I'm really gonna go back to the drawing board quite literally with this one here. So I actually want you to draw this stuff in your books now, everybody. If you wanna put dingling railroads, that sounds so weird. But we're going to start with very, very simple things, okay? What is the simplest thing that makes up my programming language? And we've already, I've already given you two examples of it. What's the smallest element? Dylan? Letters. We are going to start. I'm going to cheat a little bit because I know how big this is going to get. We have to define what a letter is in my programming language. Why do I have to go that far back to define what a letter is? There's something a little bit special about my programming language. It's because of the fact that it can't use capital letters. You have to tell it what it can and cannot use. Exactly. Because my programming language does not use capitals, I actually have to go back to letters and say that only uppercase letters are good. All right. So the way I'm going to do this is very similar to what it looks like on the website. Okay. You start drawing your line for your railroad. I do a rounded terminal. Remember, rounded terminal means whatever's in it, you need. You take it. S rectangular, or the square looking ones, you look for the other element. And I'll draw the other end of my railroad diagram. Now, this is the trap that a lot of people run into when they first start drawing railroads. Okay, they'll do this. Looks okay, really, doesn't it? Yeah, don't put sharp angles on them. Just remember, you're driving a train through this thing. Okay, and again, that's not going to go too well. So as best you can, round off the track. There'll be times where you're just being a bit lazy and yeah, the train will probably fall off the tracks, but just be a little bit nice about it. Do a round corner and you're good to go. So here's where I'm going to cheat. <laughs> what? All right, here's my cheat. I'm going to do ABC. Dot, 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 Z. There's my little cheat. I'm not going to stand here all day and draw all that. Okay, so just draw that one up in your book quickly. That is the very first element of my programming language. And now I'm going to do the digits. That did not work. Okay, and there's my digit definition. Hopefully everyone can see that all right. It's on the bottom of the screen. Same thing as the letters. I cheated again. Okay. Vanessa. I think you might be the only one that's done that so far. <laughs> Very good, guys. Oh, trying to step it up there, you know. <laughs> no worries. All good, Sam? Okay. 
Yeah, yeah, Kohen's got a good idea. What have you done with Zach today, guys? Oh, okay. Okay. I just want to give you a little bit longer if you still need to draw those down. But I want to move on to obviously something a little bit more complicated than a letter and a digit. We've done plenty of that. Yeah. Are you a sick narwhal? <laughs> What's that then? Like you read the string and what it contains? Yeah, basically. Yeah. Cool. So would you have to do these uh, letters and digit things if, say, the program is going to allow... Yeah, there was no restriction in the characters of the program to including the syntax or when we get into the exercise you'll notice that there's actually definitions for a lowercase letter and an uppercase letter and then they actually define what a letter is which could be either an uppercase or a lowercase letter and then they build on top of that elements within elements so yeah they actually go further back than just a letter in defining the upper and the lower does anyone need more time are we okay well games are built by the issue that's good all right <laughs> So the next step, everybody, is to define something a little bit more complicated than a letter or a digit. Obviously, we can have words and we can have numbers in this programming language when you start typing. So the way you would define something like that is you bring in your repetition. Okay, so if I want to define what a word is, what is the smallest word that we could potentially have? A single letter, isn't it? So we need at least to have one letter. So what you do is you drive your, your track straight into a square terminal and I put letter inside of it and that just indicates to me that I have to have at least one letter because I have to go through that terminal to be able to get out the other side. How would I add something like repetition to this? Dylan? Add a branch when it, and it comes out the other side, add a branch that loops back around to the start of the letter so it has to drive through the letter space again. Beautiful. And there's how you add repetition in railroad diagrams. So this is how I say one or more letters is this one here. Okay, and the same thing for a number. Now, I know numbers can get more complicated than just, you know, just plain unsigned integers, but we just do the exact same thing. Square rectangle, loopity loops, and then you're good. You've got numbers. But let's do one more kind of number because I don't like it. This is basically, I'm saying in my programming language, you can have numbers that are only positive. How would I add negative to that one now? You need yeah. to define what the sign is, if it's positive or negative, isn't it? And then add yeah. that to the end of the number. Got the right idea here. Yeah. I'm going to do it a little bit different than that, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create what's called a signed number just to steal that sort of terminology because we've used it a fair bit. Now, does a sign number have to be negative is my first question. No. So I'm just going to say a sign number can just be a number. I'm not going to do digit and repetition. I've already got it. All right. But just bear with me because here comes the thing. If I want to make this a negative number, what do I have to do on the front? Pardon? Put, the negative sign. Put the negative sign. Exactly. Can you just add negative numbers to a digit instead of sign? Yes, I could. I could do that if you want to. But then, oh, so you're saying like here, yeah. add negative values. Well, the issue with that is then I could grab a negative 2 and then I could grab a negative 9 and a negative 8 and it would be a very weird one. Yes, I could. I could put it here. Definitely could put it up here. But I'm just going to make them separate entities for the moment. So the way we do it, we don't have to have a negative symbol on the front of our number. But we can. So we're going to introduce an optional path. So the optional path branches at the beginning. This little guy is a negative symbol in a bubble. And he drops back down onto the tracks just before we collect our number. So I've now created a sign number because it can be positive or it can go up and grab a negative number and keep going. Is anyone confused or 
Please ask questions, guys and girls, if you need to. All right. When we do our compiler, that's where we really get stuck into like CPU arguments and RAM and things like that. This is literally just us coming up with what the text on the um, the source code looks like. That's literally it. Vincent, do you have a question there? Several negatives? Yeah. No. Because of the way, see how it's sort of facing up and then down like that? So that's how we can distinguish between a loop or an optional path. It's that sort of shape. Yeah, I like Nessa's question though, so I'll just quickly restate my, um, my answer. Could you loop this one here? And you can't because the shape of the path means the train can only travel through it once and keep going. So there's no circular loop. So this indicates a loop, this indicates an optional element. And that's pretty much it. Has anyone got any other questions on that one? I think we need to step it up in a sec, yeah? What if you wanted to find a number that had more than one digit value to it? Or, oh, right, the tickets were at seven. Yeah. That's fine. I like you asking that question because, yeah, that's, that's cool. Yeah. All right, so if we're good with that, I'm just going to quickly save this. Hopefully it's... Yep, it's called sketch, and I'll bin it. All right, so we've now got four definitions. No, five, sorry. Letter, digit, number, word... Sign number. I want to introduce a string. Now, what would be the difference between a word and a string in my programming language? A string can have digits but not a string. Fantastic. So we're going to have digits in it. What else can we have in strings that wasn't in my word? Yes, sir? Uh, would you rather have multiple of strings? Yeah, so what do you mean by like a multiple of strings? Like um, multiple of the string. Like yep. Fantastic. I could use multiple words. I can introduce digits. There's one thing that everyone's forgetting here that's really simple. Characters. Yes. Which are my letters? Space. 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 Yeah. Oh. I just wanted to hear space. That's all for the moment. But it, you got all the elements there, people, in that answer. So in my definition of my string element, I'm not going to use my word definition. Now, the reason I'm not using the word one is because I can use, if I want to introduce digits at any point, Word makes it really hard, okay? Because I can't have the word hello and put a number three in the middle of that if I feel like it. It's really difficult, isn't it? Okay, so what I'm gonna do with the string is we're gonna do like an optional path. We can go three different ways. We can either grab um, a letter or I can optionally go down and grab a digit or I can optionally go down and grab the one that Griff said, which was a space. Now, how the hell can I draw a space? Has anyone seen this? That symbol? Yes. Yeah, generally that's universal for space. Okay. In fact, that symbol comes from the shape of the bar which is underneath the space bar. If you rip up your space bar, there's a little metal bar that's that, which is that exact shape and that's where it comes from. Okay. I'm going to quickly go back up. Whoops. I need to go all the way back up. Whoa. Okay. Now what shapes am I going to use? There's three things, three terminals that I need. What shapes are they going to be? What's the letter going to be? Squarish. Digit. And circle. Yep. Aha, there it is. Yep, I'm going to loop. Um, I can't move my picture down, can I? I can crop. No, don't do that. Um, okay, I'll loop at the bottom. There's a, there's a nice way, okay. The nicest way to loop all of this would be to put it there and to loop it around like that. It just looks nicer when the loop's on the top like that. Just make sure your loop starts where that path connects and ends where the path starts. I hope that makes some sense. But you can see now we've got choosing elements in there and now we've got repeated. So my strings in my programming language must have at least one letter. Is that really true in programming languages? Do you have to have one letter in a string? No. You can have blank ones as well. And this is something I didn't think of just then. So I'm going to add another optional path down the bottom. It just goes straight up. So I can now have an empty string if I so feel like it. Okay. And I'm actually going to sort of kick myself a little bit because there's some really, really big thing that we always do with strings that I've forgotten. 
for something that I begin that's on the beginning and on the end of a string. Of the um, quotation marks. Quotations. And if you have a look at my Hello World program, it's got quotes around it. Yeah. I want to shoot myself. So as best I can fit it, I'm going to change color pens here just so it highlights it. I should have a circle terminal with quotes and then a circle terminal here with quotes. Sorry about the ugly. This is probably what your books are going to look like, so I'll leave mine like this too. Okay, sorry about that, everyone. But yeah, string must start with quotes and end with quotes. That is probably the most universal programming construct is quotes around a string. Okay, so we've brought in letters, we've brought in numbers, we've brought in digits. Oh, sorry, digits. Repetition there. Uh, spaces. Sound good? I think I'm done with the string. We've now got sign numbers, we've got strings. What other data types might we be able to choose from? If you have a look at my dingling example, one data type we haven't done yet. Booleans. Okay. Okay, so a Boolean. There's only really two things. True or false. And they go in circles. Because I have to choose between those two. Our data types are done, by the way. No, I haven't got any floats in there. Because I it's such a good programming language. That's why. Can't do fractions. But you know what? The syllabus actually tells me I have to do floats. So we're going to do floats. As much as you probably don't want to. All right. So what would a float look like? So the most common one is that one. Hopefully everyone's seen that before. That's the most common floating point number you'll ever see in a programming language. And it's often used as an example. So we have to have numbers. It has to be a decimal point or a fractional point, whatever you want to call it. And then more numbers after it. So we've already defined what a sign number can be. We've already defined what a number can be. Yeah. Yep. Sounds pretty good to me. Guys, I'm actually going to leave this one a little bit open. I'll write the answer soon. Let's just call it a float because that's what C sharp calls it. I want you to draw me what you think might be a railroad for a float. If you get it wrong, so what? At least you tried. I prefer people to fail than not try at all and swing their pen around in circles. Don't forget, everybody, a floating point should be able to be positive and negative. Do not forget that. Yes. 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 No. It can be zero point zero. Oh, so if you want to do that, you can. Yep. I'm going to make mine force, just so I can distinguish between uh, a normal number and a floating point. Mm. But if you if your definition, if you want an optional fractional point, by all means, go for it. I oh, don't go too crazy with it, Nissa. But I want to be able to write things like 3.14 minus 21.5 and things like that. Yes, that's perfect. Yeah. That's a no, great no, way to start. Hey, that's cool. <laughs> what? Yeah, no, that's cool. <laughs> By the way, Jay, I am recording all the audio. <laughs> the swear words will be in there too. Don't be afraid to fail, people. Come on. You are 100% correct, except because a sign number can have multiple digits in it and a number can have multiple digits in it. So your original without the loops is absolutely perfect. 
So we can grab a sign number, <laughs> which is negative or positive, and multiple digits. Then we grab a dot. Cool. Oh, yeah, because the numbers would say, yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly, yeah. You've already got that part of the definition, yeah, so yeah. you can just use it. <laughs> Don't know who was first there, guys. Put in a limit. Yeah, in what way? Like as in how many you can loop? We're going to let them type as many numbers as they want. We'll let the RAM take care of the limit. <laughs> That's all you need. That is it. Okay, I'll give you one more minute, everyone. Don't forget, put bool in front of what the diagram is. Yeah, perfect. Yep. Oh, okay, yep. Interesting approach. When you scroll up and you make it twice, what do you have to? So I think it's an empty data file. Okay. I'm concerned. It's called a floating point. It's a sophisticated How many points can I have? You can have as many points as you want. I can have a 2.5.5.1.2. Cool. There you go, guys. Give it a shot. I don't even try. No, you gave it a shot, which I like. Oh, go on, go on. It's okay to fail, mate. Don't forget the infinite words of SpongeBob. The first step to success is failure. Believe it or not, that was SpongeBob. I absolutely love that. First step to success is failure. All right. <laughs> it's only applicable, I'm sure. Okay. So, everyone, what I'm going to do, I am going to use all those elements that I've already created to write my floating point number. So we know that a floating point number must start with a number. So if I'm doing 3.14, this guy right here, whoop, I've circled the dot as well, no one don't want to. That there is just a number in my programming language. The dot's a dot. I don't have to include him. And 14 is just a number. Now I have to think of all the cases that could possibly be in my programming language. I could have negative 21.5 if I really wanted to. So I've got this negative on the front that I have to deal with as well. But I've already created a number which has a negative, don't I? Sign number. Sign number. So my floating point in my programming language must start with some kind of signed number. I've already got it. So I'm going to write signed number and put it in a box. And that's how we start how I can start my floating points. You can do this a much longer way, by the way. You could have rewritten the negative option and then repeated digits if you wanted to. What do I have to have after my sign number? Well, each number seems to have the decimal point. So I'm going to put a point there and circle it. So I'm, in my programming language, I'm saying that that point is compulsory. And that is what's going to distinguish between just a regular three or 3.14, okay? It tells me differences. Okay, after this dot, I don't really want to be able to put like negative 0.5. Yeah, that's impossible. That's impossible. So I'm just going to use my standard number. And that's it. That's my floating point number for my programming language. By the way, everybody, I saw plenty of different attempts. I saw um, ones that did exactly this or something slightly different. Even if you tried, I'm happy. I don't care if you got it right or wrong. This is not the only answer. There's multiple ways I could have done that. All right. Has anyone got any questions? Please feel free to fire up. Yes, I can. Yeah. But I can, in my programming language, I could go negative 3.0 if I wanted to. Yeah. I'm just saying that you have to have the dot so my compiler knows it's a floating point number as opposed to a regular signed or unsigned number. Is everyone okay with that? Please, speak up if you're not. All right. So now we have to keep going. I don't think I can actually erase that guy. Oh, I got him. All right, so we've got strings, booleans, floats, signed numbers, numbers, letters, words, digits. We've got so many things that we can play around with now. Um, really what we need to do is start looking at 
like actual lines of code that we can write. All right. The first thing I want to do is get my print function working because that's going to allow me to do a hello world program. Okay. So the whole element I'm going to draw here is going to be called print. Okay. Just to keep it simple. This is my print element. And when I write a line, have a look through my examples. If anyone, if you've got the website there, have a look at my dingling examples. I use print a couple of times and I use it slightly different in a few of them. The first one just says hello world. And we need to account for that. That's fine. But there is a couple of other things I do. Oh, yeah. Can you add another string to it? Yep. So that it's not just one, it's just a string. That's exactly right. If you have a look at the, is it the second example? Yeah. yeah. I'm doing plus username there. All right. So I need to think, how can I include strings and username, which is, what's username? Well, it's a variable. Have I defined what a variable is yet? No. No. So I'll probably need to do that before I can even do the print one. All right. If you've written the word print on your page, that's fine. I'm going to make some space for our variable. So let's focus on the variable line. So what have we got? Let's just write down there x equals 10. Highlight that. So this is what I'm trying to write. So when I create a variable in my programming language, I have to use the word there. So that's going to be in a bubble. X. Ooh, what can that be? A word. Let's use a word for that one. Because we don't want spaces or digits. I just want letters. Uh, then there's an equals. I'm going to put that in a bubble. And then I'm going to put 10. So that's um, any one of our data types. A string, a boolean, a float, or a sign number, what if you want to. There's going to be a big branch there. Now, if you have a look at my examples, I think the second one even has it. I don't have an equals somewhere, don't I? Var username. I've just got var username. All right, so I need to account for that. So I'm just going to put the other option up there. Username. Wouldn't you have to like make one for, for var as well? Variable? So it could be like a layer of words to say it could be any. No, thankfully I don't, because var is just the word, if that's what you're saying. You're just saying, we're actually about to make a railroad for variable, oh, okay. if that's what you're asking. Okay, so I'm going to call this one variable declaration. Why variable declaration? Declaring what the variable is. You know what? No, 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 no. I'm just making sure that I've got enough information. I probably don't, but we're going to go with it. Okay, so a variable declaration in my programming language, they all start with var. So let's put him in a bubble. I'm going to run out of space pretty quick. Then I have to name my variables, and each name that I've given it so far is just letters. So I'm just going to use our definition of word. So word. Does that have, does you have to define your spaces in the string? No, you don't have to go that far, thankfully. Okay. Okay, so the word variable, oh, sorry, variable must then be followed by a word. We're using our previous declaration. <laughs> okay, I'm going to squiggle down to the next line. Squiggle. This is where we branch off, actually. Because if you look, we've actually covered this second case, their username. People, there's a lot of people looking at books and shoes right now. I want you to ask me questions if you're stuck. But right now we've got two different ways that we can write a variable declaration. The first one has an equals, the second one doesn't. Now we've actually already accounted for the second one because I can go var and if I follow my word definition element, I could actually write the word username, x, a and all the other examples that I've written in that code. So to account for the second one, we can actually finish the railroad diagram right there by doing that. Just drawing a line, coming out a word, and that's it. All right. Now we've got this optional part of equals 10 at the top. So I'm going to put an equals in a bubble. So this is our, sick, this is our branching path, by the way. Then it has to be followed by, it's got 10 there, but I've also got other values going into my other variables. 
What are some of the other values I've got after the equals? True. True. Uh, poodles. Poodles is there as well. Okay. However, there are quite a few things that make up a different one. Yeah. <laughs> no. I think that's it. That's pretty much it. Cool. So we've got three, four options actually. The first one can be a sign number. I apologize if that's too small to read. Second option is it could be a string. Third option, a boolean. And then the fourth option, which I don't have an example of, but I'll include in because it makes sense, is float. Now this path, all of this needs to join up, so I'm just going to quickly... <coughs> bless you. Box it up. Okay, and the nicest thing to do in railroad diagrams, everyone, is just finish up with a single line. So this is the ugly part. This path comes back into there. All right, that's covering our variable declaration, everyone. <laughs> now, have you got? Oh, okay, that's your finishing path. Good, good stuff. All right. All good? Okay. Looks like you're about to put your hand up, that's all. Sorry, am I in the way, Nissa? Okay. All right, how are we doing for time? Okay, we're going to do a little bit more, and then we'll finish up. Yep, we're going to do a little bit more on that. because you're already here, so it makes sense to do it next. Okay. So I'm going to quickly hit save. I can still see some people drawing, so I don't want to go too quick. Okay. Does anyone need more time? Be honest. Do your right hand shit. Connor, Jordan? A little bit longer? Oh, I've got thumbs? Okay. So, let's just do a quick um, print and read are probably the only ones I want to do. Before we have a look at exercise 2.6, I think it is. It's pretty low. Pretty high number. All right. So let's do print because I promised I'd do that one. So when I print, I can either print a variable or I can print a string to the screen. We're going to ignore all the other data types for this one. So to start with, I can print, oh sorry, we have to start with the word print in a bubble. And then I can print a string and that straight away accounts for our hello world example. Print hello world, done. Sound good? Cool, let's go home. Hey? Yes. But we need to account for multiple. So, we need to add a quick option there though. I want to be able to print a variable as well. So let's branch just between print and string. And I'm just going to write the word variable. Now technically we haven't defined exactly what a variable is. I'm going to ignore that for the moment. 
we would actually have to say what a variable is, but hopefully you understand what a variable is so far. Okay, I'm just trying to speed it up a little bit, otherwise we'd be here all day. Okay. Now, how do I introduce the plus username or something like that? Uh, that was independently used by the inverted unprompted part and how it did the... Um, you mean the quotes? Yeah. No, because I put it on the string. Um, if you did the loop round, but we wasted the loop but round... You have a the variable doesn't have quotes. Variables don't have quotes around there. Yeah. Thankfully. Okay, yes, you are right. So we're going to loop the string and variable part because we can print more than one string or variable but if you notice in my code it has to have a plus yeah. so if I print hello and then I want to print the username so I have to go hello loop back around and then pick variable but if I loop there yeah. must be a plus so somewhere on that loop has to be a little round bubble so I start looping that is absolutely horrible And job done. There's our print function. I'm saying you can print multiple strings on multiple variables so long as I have a plus in between them. Fire questions at me if you've got them. If all you're hearing right now is white noise. <laughs> Probably the fan on the projector then. Potentially. Oh, no, that's, it's not variable declaration either. <laughs> We have to have an actual another one that would be variable by itself. And then we'd use that within variable declaration. So that's why I don't want to do it because we'd have to go back and change a few things. All right. I promised you quickly that we'd do the read definition as well. The read definition is fantastic. If you have a look at my syntax, it's literally the word read and then a variable. So for my answer, I the read element. Put read in the bubble. Then you put variable in a rectangle, job done. That is our print and our read functions. Once you've written all those notes down, can you all have a look under the exercises tab? I'm just going to quickly get the number. It is 2.6. Wow. God, I got that right. Have a look at 2.6, which is metal languages. It's a pretty big question. So go and have a look at it and just familiarize yourself with the railroad diagrams that exist. All right? So if you got half of what we talked about today and we can practice it to get 100%, you've done really well. Um, so yep. with these other ones, um, the other exercises that we did in the hand in last term, when do you want those? I'll put up a spot for this term where you're going to put basically all the topic two. Okay, fair enough. Just like we did with um, topic one. No, no. I just haven't got a spot to upload them yet. Sir, I've played this problem already. Yeah.